Dr. Eric here to talk about prostate cancer. This topic occupies entire books, so I won't cover everything here, but enough of the basics to lay a good foundation. If you have any questions after watching the video, please post in the comments section. You're probably here because either you or someone you care about was diagnosed with prostate cancer. I'm gonna give you some important prostate cancer basics and tools that can help guide you through this journey. Firstly, what is prostate cancer? Prostate cancer is the uncontrolled irregular growth and spread of mutated prostate cells. The most common type of prostate cancer is called prostatic adenocarcinoma. For some reason, these cells have begun duplicating in an uncontrolled manner. Usually, testosterone fuels these cells in the beginning. This allows the cells to grow and then spread. Symptoms of prostate cancer are typically limited to a high PSA blood test or an abnormal rectal exam. Only when the cancer is very advanced do patients have pain, bleeding, or other symptoms. Prostate cancer is usually detected through a prostate biopsy, which is a test where small pieces of tissue are taken from the prostate and examined under the microscope. When evaluating prostate cancer, we assign patients into groups based on their risk. There are traditionally three groups, low, intermediate, and high risk. The way patients get put into these groups is by looking at three things, the PSA, the rectal exam, and the Gleason score. And I'm gonna explain all three of those for you. The first is PSA. PSA is a protein made by prostate cells and can be elevated in prostate cancer. More cancer cells usually means more PSA being made. The higher the PSA, the higher the risk. PSA is a simple blood test. On the rectal exam, the doctor may feel your prostate is normal or may feel a lump or bump called a nodule. Not all nodules are cancer, but when cancer is found, a bigger nodule means higher risk. Gleason score is a number that is based on how aggressive the cancer cells look under the microscope. Gleason score can only be obtained after a prostate biopsy or other prostate surgery where tissue is obtained. The Gleason score goes from six to 10, not from one to 10. Six is the least aggressive and 10 is the most aggressive. The higher the Gleason score, the higher the risk. The Gleason score has two numbers, such as three plus three or four plus five. The two numbers added together give the total Gleason score. The first number represents the most dominant cancer type. The second represents the second most dominant cancer type. The order can be important, but isn't important enough to get into here. This table that I'm gonna show you is from the National Comprehensive Cancer Network and shows how the risk groups are assigned. Low risk men, have a Gleason 6 disease and a PSA less than 10, and at most a small nodule on one side of the prostate. If they also have fewer than three cores on the biopsy, three little pieces that were positive, and each with less than 50% involvement, they drop into the very low risk category. Intermediate risk is patients with PSA 10 to 20, or a nodule involving an entire side of the prostate or both sides of the prostate, or a Gleason score of seven. The favorable, favorable group are the Gleason three plus four with no core showing more than 50% involvement. Unfavorable are the rest. Patients with a Gleason score of eight or higher, PSA greater than 20, or disease outside of the prostate are high risk. The reason the risk groupings are important is that the lower the risk, the more likely we are able to cure the disease and usually with less aggressive treatment. There are generally three common treatment options for prostate cancer. 
These vary a bit depending on the risk group of the patient, but I'll go through them generally. The first option is called active surveillance. With active surveillance, we're basically saying, look, we know there's cancer here, but we think it's a very slow-growing tumor and not aggressive, so maybe we can just watch it and nothing will happen. This is a very reasonable option for some men. It does involve continued routine PSA blood checks and periodic prostate biopsies and or prostate MRI tests. This option is most commonly utilized for men in the very low risk and low risk groups. Some men in the favorable intermediate risk group can also be considered for active surveillance. There is another option called watchful waiting, which is often confused with active surveillance. They are not the same. Watchful waiting means really doing nothing, not even keeping an eye on the disease with PSAs and biopsies. This is really only for men with a life expectancy less than 10 years. The second option is surgery. Most commonly, this is a robotic radical prostatectomy. In this surgery, the entire prostate, along with the seminal vesicles, is removed. The urethra and bladder are then reconnected. Often, the pelvic lymph nodes will also be removed at the same time. Typically, this surgery takes around three hours and involves an overnight hospital stay. A urethral catheter is left in place for seven to 10 days in most cases. Some activity restrictions, such as lifting restrictions, are made for about three weeks to allow for safe healing. Surgery is a reasonable option for any man with a diagnosis of localized prostate cancer, meaning it hasn't spread to other parts of the body other than the prostate and possibly local lymph nodes around the prostate. The third option is radiation therapy. There are many different types of radiation therapy, which is beyond the scope of this video, but can include IMRT, SBRT, and brachytherapy or SEEDS. For men with unfavorable intermediate risk or high risk prostate cancer, hormone therapy is typically added to the treatment for anywhere from six to 18 months. Some men may get up to three years of hormone therapy. Usually, there are no activity restrictions during radiation treatment. Radiation is a reasonable option for any man with a diagnosis of localized prostate cancer. In most studies, surgery and radiation therapy have equivalent cure rates. So it's not that one option is better than the other. They're different and every patient will have his own preference. The major difference is that with surgery, the side effects happen immediately and get better with time. With radiation, the side effects happen years after the treatment and can, but don't always, get worse with time. The important side effects to consider are impotence, or difficulty with erections, and incontinence, or leakage of urine with cough, laugh, sneeze, or exertion. With surgery, again, these happen immediately and may improve with time. With radiation, they don't happen immediately, but they can develop five, 10, 20 years down the road. There are some other options out there that are newer and less well studied. These include prostate cryotherapy, laser therapy, and HIFU, or high intensity focused ultrasound. At this time, these are really considered experimental, so I'm not going to cover them. Remember, those options I've mentioned, active surveillance, surgery, and radiation, are typically for men with localized disease, whether it's low, intermediate, or high risk. In some cases, prostate cancer isn't detected until it is already spread to other parts of the body. This is called metastatic prostate cancer. In this situation, rarely can the cancer be cured. In very select cases, surgery or radiation may be used, but this is often in a clinical trial or an experimental setting. Most men with metastatic prostate cancer will go on to hormone therapy called androgen deprivation therapy. Most commonly, this will involve a shot every three to six months that drops the testosterone down to near zero. 
This is because testosterone is a major driving factor in most prostate cancers. Lowering the testosterone is like sucking the gas out of your car's engine. This will slow or even reverse most prostate cancers for years. Less commonly, the disease is so advanced at the time of diagnosis that more aggressive options are immediately taken. These could include chemotherapy, newer hormone medications, or even radiation to affected body parts like the spine. The key takeaway from this video should be that while there is no single right way to treat your prostate cancer, for most men, it is very treatable and manageable. The majority of men diagnosed with prostate cancer will not die of prostate cancer. I hope this information has helped you to better understand the basics of prostate cancer. Please click the subscribe button to stay up to date on my health videos. And as always, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments section below.